Arnold Bennett once said that if there was one word that could clear a public place in Britain quicker than any other, it was the word poetry. He may have been right. And yet, for 600 years, poetry has been the supreme English art, recognized all over the world in a way our music, our painting, our sculpture has never been. Since the time of Chaucer in the 14th century, right up to today, English poetry has represented all our moods shown in many different kinds of poems. Love lyrics, religious poems, storytelling, satire and stage plays, and jokes even in limericks and nonsense rhymes. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you continually stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In all the 600 years of English poetry, there have been no really dead periods, something unique in the literature of the world. What we've tried to do in this series of programs is to follow through this long story from Chaucer right down to the present day, century by century, poem by poem. Sometimes a whole program is given over to one great poet, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth. More often, we've fitted a number of poets into a single program to show the scope and range of what was happening and what was being written at any one time. And throughout, our emphasis has been to show the many and various pleasures poetry can give, not as a series of lessons, but as a series of entertainments. This is a living literature, the living speech of men and women, whether it comes from 1400 or 1800 or today. In Western literature, the history of the novel is quite short, a matter of only 250 years or so. The economy and neatness of verse make a story memorable. As in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, listen to part of Chaucer's introduction, spoken in the pronunciation of that time, almost exactly 600 years ago in the 1380s. One mid April, with his sure as soda, the drucht of March hath passed to the rota, and bothered every vine in sweet liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the fluor. One Zephyrus eke with his sweat of breath, in spirit hath in every holt and hearth the tender croppers, and the younger son hath in the ram his halver cosy run, and smaller fool is and melody that slepen all the mist with open e, so pricketh him nature in here garages. Then longen folk to go on, on pilgrimages, and Palmer for the second strongest strondes to Ferna Holloway's, couth in sunry Londres. And specially, from every shearer's end of England to Canterbury they wend, the holy blissful master for to seca, that him at open, one that they were seca. That's just part of the beginning of a very long poem, a whole series of verse tales. But very many poems, and many of the poems we've included, are brief, intense moments of experience. As in the reflections composed in the year 1586 by a young man, Chidioch Tichborn, as he waited in his death cell on the eve of his execution. My prime of life is but a frost of cares. My feast of joy is but a dish of pain. My crop of corn is but a field of tares, and all my good is but vain hope of gain. My life is fled, 
and yet I saw no sun, and now I live, and now my life is done. I sought my death, and found it in my womb. I looked for life, and saw it was a shade. I trod the earth, and knew it was my tomb, and now I die, and now I am but made. My glass is full, and now my glass is run, and now I live, and now my life is done. Since the time of the ancient Greeks, the theatre has been a place for poetry, and our greatest playwright is also our greatest poet. Though Shakespeare didn't die until the year 1616, when he was 52, his final play, The Tempest, seems a true epilogue to that busy 20-year-long career. Prospero, the all-powerful magician, renounces his magic and gives up his art. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes of groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back, you demi-puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make whereof the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms, but rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, brought forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vaults at roaring war, to the dread rattling thunder have I given fire, and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt. The strong-based promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped and let them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I here abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms of the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. The 17th century was a period of the finest English religious verse. John Donne, Henry Vaughan, Thomas Traherne, John Milton, George Herbert. Herbert became a parish priest, and in many of his poems, you seem to hear the tones of a highly intelligent, but also deeply sympathetic shepherd of his flock, speaking simply and directly and dramatically, as in his sonnet, Redemption, a story-like parable. Having been tenant long to a rich lord, not thriving, I resolve it to be bold and make a suit unto him to afford a new small rented lease and cancel the old. In heaven at his manor I him sought. They told me there that he was lately gone about some land which he had dearly bought long since on earth to take possession. I straight returned and knowing his great birth, sought him accordingly in great resorts, in cities, theatres, gardens, parks, and courts. At length I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. There I him espied, who straight, your suit is granted, said, and died. A little later in the 17th century, Milton wrote his epic religious poem, Paradise Lost, a vast and ambitious account of the struggle between God and Satan, good and evil, the fall of the rebel angels, the creation and fall of man, a formidable and heroic work. Many readers have seen Satan as the real hero of Milton's poem. Certainly he is given some of the grandest passages, as in this fierce speech, in which Satan, cast down by God to hell with the other rebel angels, speaks defiantly to be Elzebub, his second in command. But, though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will, 
and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield, and what is else not to be overcome. That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire. That were low indeed. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall, since by fate, the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail, since through experience of this great event, in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may, with more successful hope, resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs and in the excess of joy Soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. The 18th century was an age in which satirical poetry was refined and perfected. Waspish, witty, sometimes devastating, and very often crisp and full of common sense. In one of Jonathan Swift's burlesque pieces, he mocks the squabbling ambitions and envy of minor poets. Hobbes clearly proves that every creature lives in a state of war by nature. The greater for the smaller watch, but meddle seldom with their match. A whale of moderate size will draw a shoal of herrings down his maw. A fox with geese his belly crams. A wolf destroys a thousand lambs. But search among the rhyming race. The brave are worried by the base. If on Parnassus top you sit, you rarely bite, are always bit. Each poet of inferior size on you shall rail and criticize, and try to tear you limb from limb, while others do as much for him. The vermin only tease and pinch their foes superior by an inch. So, naturalists observe, a flea hath smaller fleas which on him prey, and these hath smaller yet to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. Thus, every poet in his kind is bit by him that comes behind. Throughout the history of poetry, there have been poets who wrote against the grain of their own time, who were largely ignored and only properly appreciated after their deaths. William Blake, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, was such a poet a visionary in whom plainness and paradox, the mystical and the lyrical, go hand in hand. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames doth flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plague, the marriage hurts. The Romantic Movement, as it's called, has Blake as one of its ancestors. That movement towards the free imagination, the unfettered spirit, which was part of the force behind the American War of Independence and the French Revolution. Romanticism's chief literary pioneer in England was Wordsworth. Wordsworth called himself a worshipper of nature, but human nature is bound up with inanimate nature. And often in Wordsworth, the two are so closely linked that they merge and become one. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones.
stones and trees. Such romantic poets as Byron and Shelley in the early 19th century were unconventional and radical in a way that influenced many later notions of what sort of creature a poet was. Mad, bad and dangerous to know, like Byron, or even ineffectual angels like Shelley. But these labels give a poor idea of these poets. Shelley saw the English establishment of his day as a vile tyranny. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from over the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met Murder on the way. He had a mask like Castle Ray. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight, for one by one and two by two he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. Next came Fraud, and he had on, like Eldon, an ermined gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. And the little children who, round his feet, played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out by them. Last came anarchy. He rode on a white horse, splashed with blood. He was pale even to the lips, like death in the apocalypse. And he wore a kingly crown, and in his grasp a scepter shone. On his brow this mark I saw. I am God and king, and law. The Victorian age was the great age of the novel, from the Bronte sisters through to Dickens. But Emily Bronte was a poet as well as a novelist, and in her poems you feel the same strange and secret powers of Wuthering Heights. Wind, snow, an isolated house, something imminent and inexplicable outside, beyond the lamp and the window. Silent is the house, all are laid asleep. One alone looks out o'er the snow wreaths deep, watching every cloud, dreading every breeze that whirls the wildering drift and bends the groaning trees. Cheerful is the hearth, soft the matted floor, not one shivering gust creeps through pane or door, the little lamp burns straight, its rays shoot strong and far. I trim it well to be the wanderer's guiding star. What I love shall come like visitant of air, safe in secret power from lurking human snare. What loves me, no word of mine shall e'er betray, though for faith unstained, my life must forfeit pay. Burn then, little lamp, glimmer straight and clear. Hush, a rustling wing stirs, methinks, the air. He for whom I wait thus ever comes to me. Strange power, I trust thy might. Trust thou my constancy. In the second half of the 19th century, American poets, often isolated and solitary at first in what they were trying to do, established a new spirit of their own. Poetry written in the English language, but distinct. In Edgar Allan Poe, Walt Whitman. None was more isolated than Emily Dickinson, the New England spinster who, in her tiny, angular, chilling poems, created a universe of feeling in a room from which she hardly ever stirred. My life closed twice before its close. It yet remains to see if immortality unveil a third event to me. So huge so hopeless to conceive as these that twice befell. Parting is all we know of heaven. 
and all we need of hell. In England, Thomas Hardy, the novelist, was also, and increasingly as time went on, Hardy the poet. A poet who could sum up in a few ironical lines a whole shattering incident, as here in a church where the clergyman has just finished his sermon in front of an admiring congregation. And now to God the Father, he ends, and his voice thrills up to the topmost tile. Each listener chokes as he bows and bends, and emotion pervades the crowded aisles. Then the preacher glides to the vestry door and shuts it and thinks he is seen no more. The door swings softly ajar meanwhile and a pupil of his in the Bible class who adores him as one without gloss or guile sees her idol stand with a satisfied smile and reenact at the vestry glass each pulpit gesture in deaf dumb show that had moved the congregation so. W.B. Yeats died at the beginning of 1939, a few months before the outbreak of the Second World War. Like many people in the 1930s, he could see the direction in which things were drifting. He was not an unpolitical animal, but in his blood, he could feel that there were sometimes more important things than politics. Even in his old age, he could still feel the restlessness, the sexuality of youth. How can I, that girl standing there, my attention fix on Roman or on Russian or on Spanish politics? Yet here's a traveled man that knows what he talks about, and there's a politician that has read and thought and maybe what they say is true of war and war's alarms. But oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. There are probably more people writing poetry today than ever before. Most of it will never be published. Most of it is not very good, but that's always been the case. Time does its work. The best survives as you will hear and see in the programs that follow. To end this program, here is a poem by one of our best living poets, Ted Hughes, capturing something of the process, the skill, the mystery of actually making a poem. I imagine this midnight moment's forest. Something else is alive beside the clock's loneliness and this blank page where my fingers move. Through the window I see no star. Something more near, though deeper within darkness, is entering the loneliness. Cold, delicately as the dark snow, a fox's nose touches twig, leaf, two eyes serve a movement, but now, and again now, and now, and now, sets neat prints into the snow between trees and warily a lame shadow lags by stump and in hollow of a body that is bold to come across clearings an eye a widening deepening greenness brilliantly concentratedly coming about its own business till with a sudden sharp hot stink of fox it enters the dark hole of the head. The window is starless still. The clock ticks. The page is printed.